America's number one national television program on Asia. Hello, I'm Yusai Khan. Welcome to Looking East. Shanghai, with a population of about 12 million, is the largest city in China. Tonight, we'll take a look at this important city, its fascinating past, and its thriving present. You will meet its illustrious mayor, Mayor Jiang Ziming, see some surprising Shanghainese architecture, and finally, tour Shanghai's old town, the only part of the city that has never known foreign occupation. It is here that the traditional customs of the native Shanghainese are kept alive. When you hear the sounds of style, the words Regent International Hotels can never be far behind. Malaysia, an experience more than you could ever imagine. And the golden experience begins right here on Malaysia Airlines. Morning in Shanghai, China's largest city and busiest port, located near the mouth of the Great River Yangtze. As with elsewhere in China, people gather for their Taiji exercises, a ritual that begins very early, even before daybreak. Then, as the morning wears on, many would adjourn to these nearby food stalls for breakfast before heading off to work. All very mundane, typical scenes which start off the day in a Chinese city. Yet, there was a time when Shanghai was anything but typically Chinese when it was known as the Paris of Asia. Unlike the other great cities of China, the name of Shanghai does not conjure up images of antiquity or natural scenic beauty. And while it had existed for centuries prior to the Opium War, Shanghai came into international prominence after 1842 when the Treaty of Nanjing which resulted from the war, declared Shanghai an international port. The treaty allowed Westerners to trade and lease land there, privileged zones or concessions for the British, French and Americans were established, most notably along the waterfront facing the Huangpu River. The area is known as the Bund, which is itself an Anglo-Indian word meaning embankment.
In the years after the fall of the Manchu dynasty, Shanghai's reputation grew as a decadent metropolis, rampant with prostitutes and gangsters, show business and big business. Native Shanghainese became known for being shrewd businessmen. Important industries like steel and textiles flourished. Yet at the same time, there grew an underclass of the exploited, slave laborers, beggars, armies of the poor and homeless. This coexistence of extreme affluence and poverty made Shanghai a breeding ground of revolutionary politics. The Chinese Communist Party was founded here in 1921. Many of the unsavory aspects contributing to the city's notoriety were rooted out when the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949. It was the state's intention to develop Shanghai as a leading industrial center for the country. So the city continued its growth as its population soared from around 5 million people in 1949 to almost 12 million in 1982. Yet the years have not been kind to Shanghai. While it has survived Japanese occupation during World War II, social and economic upheaval in the post-war years leading up to the liberation and the debilitating effects of the Cultural Revolution, Shanghai today seems to be straining from the weight of its own size and overpopulation. It seems outpaced by other Chinese cities which are flourishing in the climate of modernization advocated by Deng Xiaoping. Shanghai has the worst housing shortage in all of China. No major roads have been built since 1949. Nearly three million bicycles clog the streets, slowing traffic and hurting commerce. Try getting on a bus on Nanjing Road, the city's main thoroughfare, or try making a telephone call across town or try finding a place to get away from the noise, dirt, and congestion. You will see why Shanghai isn't about to win any contests as the most livable city in China. Jiang Ziming, the city's aggressive new mayor, hopes to change all that. I asked him what is the most urgent problem facing Shanghai. The most urgent problems facing Shanghai people, the problems they are most concerned about, are number one, housing, number two, transportation or the congestion of traffic, and number three is pollution. <coughs> but yet, not only air pollution, also including the water pollution. I also asked about Shanghai's narrow streets. Shanghai's streets are much more narrow than in Beijing. On top of that, the situation is exacerbated by the growth of small businesses, the stores, the grocery stores which used to sell things like vegetables and meats and other types of foodstuffs. You see, these stores tried to expand and sell more products. And so what they've done is literally taking their business out into the street. Consequently, the space for pedestrians is even more restricted. What used to be narrow streets have become even narrower. So the first part of our plan is to take these expanded stores off the street. They simply have to move everything out. In addition to widening the streets, the mayor would like to improve road conditions by creating a three-tiered traffic system. Construction of an underground subway is scheduled to begin in 1988 and plans for an elevated highway are also under consideration. But narrow streets are not the only problem the mayor faces. Another is that the Shanghainese simply do not like to live outside of city limits. 
In Shanghai, there's a saying that goes, I'd prefer to have just a bed space in the heart of the city than to have a whole suite of rooms outside the city. The traffic more convenient, the shopping more convenient, education. In fact, the people will remain in the city until suburbs are built with modern amenities to attract the city dwellers. Not only improved transportation, but services such as supermarkets and shopping centers, schools and nurseries are needed to lure the people away from the congested city. Coming up next, more on Shanghai. For centuries, artisans in the imperial city of Beijing have created works of imperial quality. Today, this tradition continues at the Beijing Jade Factory. See how craftsmen create these works of exquisite beauty and buy them at the lowest prices. So while in Beijing, visit our factory or our main stores, the Arts and Crafts Service Center and the White Peacock. Imperial quality at an affordable price. China Today. Experience the excitement and wonder with CAAC, the national airline of the People's Republic of China. CAAC flies to China more frequently than any other airline with nonstop service from San Francisco. Flights also originate from New York and Los Angeles. Experience China Today with CAAC. One airline takes care of the Pacific traveler like no other, with the only first-class concierge at every gateway airport and a superb onboard menu to help the Pacific traveler arrive relaxed, refreshed, and ready to do business. Maybe that's why one airline flies more people across the Pacific than any other. United, rededicated to giving you the service you deserve. Come fly the friendly skies. For a tourist in Shanghai, one of the most impressive things about the city is the architecture which recalls its cosmopolitan past. In areas which used to be the French and international concessions, there are stunning consulate buildings and millionaire residences in architectural styles ranging from Gothic to Art Deco. However, many of these buildings seem old and run down today with windows and balconies cluttered with clothes lines and laundry. It seems only a matter of time before they give way to monotonous, unsightly high-rise complexes. I asked the mayor about a building preservation policy. Now we do have a kind of building policy. For the buildings that are more beautiful and have historical value, then we do our best to preserve them and keep them in the original style. But there are also other buildings to which we have to take a different attitude, because we have to comply with our renovation plans for, say, an entire neighborhood, and we have to conform to a particular building style for that neighborhood. But a visitor to Shanghai may not have preservation on his mind. It may be the food. Shanghai cuisine is among the best in China, and there are many fine restaurants where one can sample the fare. You haven't lived until you have tasted the delicious Shanghai crab. There's also plenty of shopping to do in Shanghai. The number one department store here is the largest store in China. And while the name is rather ordinary, the store itself is not. 
Over 400,000 shoppers pass through the aisles each day, choosing from a wide variety of consumer items. And many of these people are not just window shopping. There are a number of interesting tourist sites for the visitors to Shanghai. This famous Jade Buddha was brought to China from Burma. It is over 1,000 years old. High atop a hill in the suburbs is the largest Roman Catholic church in the Far East, more evidence of the influence of the West. And tourists can do as the Shanghainese do, visit the Longhua Pagoda and admire the plum blossoms. In the evening, Shanghai offers a wide choice of cultural events. Foreigners are important to Shanghai's future not just as tourists, but as businessmen as well. Over the years, Shanghai has been the commercial hub of China. The city's 8,000 industries account for 10% of China's total industrial output. Blessed with good geography, Shanghai offers convenient transportation up the Yangtze into the heart of China and out of its ports to the rest of the world. To maintain its economic position, Shanghai needs to attract more foreign investment. Joint ventures with foreign companies have been encouraged. New hotels and facilities are being built to accommodate more visitors and in a more luxurious way. Mayor Jiang also told us of a planned shift in the city's productive resources away from reliance on heavy industry to lighter manufacturing such as bicycles, refrigerators, televisions and other high-tech products. Even so, much of the city's revenue will still come from shipping and related industries. But at least now the city will be allowed to keep more of its income as the central government has decided to put more money back into the development of Shanghai. But the mayor thinks Shanghai's greatest resource is its people. It is said that the Shanghai people are more clever, more wise, smarter. People say Shanghainese are shrewd people. Foreign businessmen always say because the Shanghainese are shrewd, they are hard to do business with. But I say, if you want a partner to do business with, who would you prefer? Somebody who is smart or somebody who is foolish? Of course, you'd go with the smart one. Next, the old Chinese city.
When people speak of old Shanghai, they are probably referring to the westernized city of the 1920s and 30s. But there is an old Shanghai even today. This is the part of town known as the Chinese city. It's the oldest inhabited part of Shanghai. The area was once surrounded by a moat and a wall over 20 feet high and three miles long, built to keep out Japanese pirates in the 16th century. Most of the wall is gone now, and today outsiders, Japanese included, are welcome to stroll through these picturesque lanes and patronize their stores. <laughs> One popular attraction is Yuyuan, a classical Chinese garden with greenery, waterfalls and stunning ornamental rock formations. Equally popular is Hu Xingting, which literally means pavilion in the middle of the lake. It houses snack bars, tea houses, and restaurants. at the oldest tea house in Shanghai is over 130 years old. The store is open from 4 o'clock in the morning until about 9 o'clock at night, and people come here do nothing but drink tea and socialize. They serve about 10 different kinds of tea from all parts of China, and depends on the grade of the tea, you pay either 15 cents per pot or 40 cents per pot. So now we drink tea. The tea cup yay, must be high. Above your eyebrows. <laughs> Another favorite item served at a nearby restaurant is dim sum. This is not quite the same as dim sum served in southern Cantonese restaurants. Shanghainese dim sum is hearty and more filling. The portions are substantially larger too. Of course, since this is such a hot spot for tourists, tables are hard to find, so you may be better off eating on your feet. As if to cater to the whims of tourists, who believe they are in a truly traditional Chinese neighborhood, the goods sold here are decidedly low-tech. Being close to tea houses, you can naturally find a wide variety of teas or teapots. Aren't these some of the most beautiful teapots you have ever seen? These are traditional Chinese and glazed pottery teapots. And these are made by hand, each design unique on its own, not for mass exports. In the country of chopsticks, you can certainly find a chopstick store where you can buy just about any kind of chopsticks. This is a gift package for somebody who is having a birthday, somebody who's an old man having a birthday. You can give this away as a gift. This, if you want to give away for somebody who is getting married. Now, I have never seen this before, but look at this gorgeous gift box. 
where you can have six pairs of chopsticks all stored away. <laughs> of course, in traditional Chinese stores like these, you don't expect them to tally up your bill with a calculator. We have planned to see more of the old Chinese city, but we miscalculated the amount of time it would take us to get through the traffic, the human traffic. It is said that half the people you see on the streets of Shanghai are Chinese people from other cities and provinces. I think we saw most of these out-of-towners here today. The Chinese government has designated Shanghai as one of the 14 Kaifang Changshi, special cities open to the outside. Special legislation has been passed to encourage foreign trade and investment in these cities. Given the creativity, drive and ingenuity of the Shanghainese, I'm sure it will once again become the center that it once was. That's our show for tonight. See you next week. I'm Yu Sai Khan for Looking East.